So if you will turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 50. This year's Nobel Peace Prize was awarded Friday. There were two winners announced. Nadia Murad was 21 years of age and a member of the Yazidi religious minority in Iraq when she was captured in the year 2014 by ISIS militants for three months. Nadia was raped and tortured multiple times before she escaped from her captors. Since then, she's been remarkably candid about her experience in the year 2016. She spoke for, before the United Nations, urging the world to bring those who are guilty of human trafficking and genocide to justice and bring an end to those crimes. Murad shares the Nobel Peace Prize Award with 63-year-old Dr. Dennis McWagie from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Dr. McWagie has treated tens of thousands of female victims of sexual violence in his country. The surgeon has put his life as well as the life of his family at risk because he publicly criticizes his country for turning an eye to this abuse and crime. These two brave warriors are a voice to victims who oftentimes have no voice. The dictionary defines a victim as someone who has been injured, oppressed, mistreated, perhaps even lost their life at the hands of another individual or as the result of an accident or some catastrophe. Nearly every one of us has probably been a victim at one time or another, whether it was physical abuse or sexual abuse or verbal abuse, or, or whether it was spiritual in nature. And the focus of today's message is an individual who was unjustly separated from his family for many years. And his experience should encourage all of us who have ever been victims to turn the mess of our situation into a message that God uses to inspire, encourage, enlighten, and motivate other people. So. Genesis chapter 50, I, I hope you um, take time to read uh, the chapters. Uh, Joseph's story takes up a lot of uh, Genesis. And I have on the bottom of your insert there um, the chapters to read for next week's message because it helps. We obviously don't have time to read all of this. So I'm going to, uh, this is kind of towards the end of Joseph's <clears throat> life. I'm going to start with uh, chapter 50 and verse 14. After burying Jacob, his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had accompanied him to his father's burial. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, Please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. God brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by kindly speaking to them. So if you take out the outline there on the inside of your bulletins, for those of you who were here last week, you might recognize that first point, which is sin always has consequences. Why do we have that point again? Because it hasn't changed. Sin always has consequences. Paul reminds us in Galatians 6 and verse 7 that we reap what we sow. It's a fact of life. It's a fact of nature that fig trees produce figs and grapevines produce grapes and corn stalks produce corn and good comes out of good people and evil comes out of evil people. And James tells us in his New Testament letter that evil isn't God's fault. 
James reminds us it is our wrong desires, our choices that give birth to sin. And sin always has consequences. And indulged in long enough and often enough, James says sin is going to control us. And ultimately, sin leads to death. Now, if you read today's assigned scriptures, you, and if you haven't, read them later on this afternoon. You know that Joseph found himself in a horrible mess. He was falsely accused of sexual assault, thrown in prison because he steadfastly and continually resisted the advances of his boss's wife. So Joseph sat in prison for well over two years, far away from home, tarnished reputation, no legal recourse for appealing his sentence. For all he knew, he would rot in jail. Joseph was in a mess, and frankly, he's in prison, and it really wasn't his fault. Believe it or not, Jacob, Joseph's dad, had a role in his son's predicament. If you have your Bibles, chapter 37 of Genesis, verses 3 and 4, we read, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made just for Joseph, a beautiful robe. And as a result, Joseph's brothers hated Joseph because their father loved them more than he loved the rest of them. And their father's favoritism was so obvious to all of the other siblings, they couldn't even find anything nice to say about their brother or to their brother. What, was it his fault they were so resentful towards him? Well, not fully, but maybe just a little. Because if we look in verses 5 through 11, Joseph shared a couple of dreams he had with his brothers. And, and in those dreams, his brothers were all bowing down to him, and he was ruling over them. Now, I'm the oldest in our family, and I can tell you, if my little brother had come to me and said, hey, man, I had this dream, and you were bowing down to me. You, I was ruling over you. I might have had the same reaction that these guys did. It didn't sit well with them. And later on, Jacob sends Joseph to take some provisions to his brothers who are out tending sheep. And what does Joseph choose to wear? He wears this robe that dad had given just him. It looked like something royalty would wear. And it just felt to them like Joseph was rubbing that in their faces. But ultimately, it wasn't Jacob's fault and it wasn't Joseph's fault. His brothers conspired to take his life. And even though one of his brothers, Reuben, wanted to intervene and spare Joseph's life, the other nine, when Reuben wasn't there, the other nine saw some slave traders going by and said, hey, let's, let's sell them to, to these slave traders who were on their way to Egypt. So Jacob, his father, his favoritism played a role in, in uh, what happened, and certainly Joseph's attitude and his arrogance played a role, but ultimately it was the brother's sins that resulted in Joseph being in the mess that he was far away from home. He, he was a victim. And who would have blamed him if sitting there in jail, he would have felt sorry for himself? I mean, as I'm reading his story, I feel sorry for him. He's far away from home. His family probably presumed that he was dead. No one, no one knew he was in prison. I mean, for all he knew, he'd never get out. But the one thing Joseph didn't do, and, and we shouldn't do either, is complain. Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 2 that we are to do everything without complaining or grumbling so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in the midst of a warped and crooked culture. Only then will we shine like stars in the sky among 
everyone else as we hold out the word of life. You see, when we act like everybody else, we look like everybody else. It's when we act more like Jesus that we shine in the midst of this culture we live in. I'm reminded of Paul and Silas and their situation in Acts 22. They were arrested. They were stripped of their clothes. They were beaten with rods. And they were flogged with a whip. What was their response? They let God have it, didn't they? They gave God a severe tongue lashing and they said, man, there is no reason we deserve to be here in this prison. No, they didn't. At midnight, they had a praise service. And while they're singing, all of the other prisoners are listening to them sing. And all of a sudden, there's this earthquake, and the doors, not just to their cell, but to everybody's cell, and open up, and the chains that had been on them fell off. One thing I've learned over the years is that God doesn't promise to keep us out of messes. He may sometimes, but he doesn't promise to do that. What he does promise is that he'll be there with us in the mess. And he will turn our messes into a message that we can use to point others to him. But sin always has consequences. And secondly, we learned this last week as well, God always has a plan, always. Solomon told us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is a time for everything. There is a season for every activity under heaven. There's a time to be silent, and there's a time to speak out. 800 years before the time of of Christ, God commissioned a prophet named Jonah to preach to the great city of Nineveh. Nineveh would soon become the capital of the vast Assyrian Empire. And here's what God said to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, Nineveh was about 500 miles away from Israel, 500 miles. I mean, that's a pretty good jaunt in today's terms, whether you're taking an airplane or, or, or traveling in a car, but 500 miles. And God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach and to warn the people of that city of the impending judgment that would come upon that city if they didn't repent. Now, folks, the Assyrians were known for their evil practices their exploitation of the helpless, their idolatry. Prostitution was, was rampant, and they were known for their witchcraft. It was a wicked empire. It was the ISIS, the Al-Qaeda of, of Jonah's day. And Jonah didn't want to go to preach there in Nineveh. I mean, he was afraid that if he did, they might repent. And that was the last thing Jonah wanted to see them do. He wanted to see judgment come down upon them. Well, many years later, Nahum would prophesy the destruction of Nineveh, and it would be destroyed. But for now, God knew there were people in Nineveh who would repent, who were waiting to repent. So so Jonah was sent to tell them. Now, he didn't go right away, did he? And even when he went, he went kind of reluctantly. He he racked up all of these frequent travel miles that he really didn't need to. But he ultimately went, and God knew what he was doing. Many of the people in Nineveh repented. 500 years before the time of Christ, Xerxes became king over a world power known as Persia. An evil man named Haman had convinced the king to issue a decree that would result in the annihilation of all the Jews throughout the entire Persian Empire. What neither Haman or anybody else knew, including the king, is that the king had a a Hebrew bride named Esther. Esther's uncle Mordecai reminds his, his niece that, listen, 
God doesn't willy-nilly just put people in, in places and positions by accident. Mordecai tells Esther, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from someplace else. Now, why would he say that? Because even when God calls us to do something, if we don't respond, he has a way of still accomplishing his plan. But who knows, Mordecai says, that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now listen, if you've read the story about Esther, it's amazing the whole process that took for this, this Hebrew girl in a foreign land to ultimately find herself as the queen of Persia. It didn't happen by accident. It was orchestrated by God because God has a way of putting people in the right place at the right time and he put Esther here to save her people from a certain holocaust. That's just the way God is. He places his people in strategic places for a purpose and a reason. On April 16th of 2006, a student named Shuang, Shuang Cho, a senior at Virginia Tech University, went on a shooting rampage. Maybe many of you remember that. By the time his murderous spree ended, when he took his own life, Cho had killed 32, 32 people and wounded 17 others. Most of those shot were attending classes in the Norris Hall building, which housed the engineering school. Cho had chained the doors to that building so that no one could escape. Leviu Lebrescu was a Romanian Jew who had survived the Nazi Holocaust. After World War II, he moved to Israel where he taught in Israel and then later still moved to teach at Virginia Tech University. As Cho tried to enter Labrescu's classroom, the 76-year-old professor, 76 years old, held the door while instructing his students to escape out the windows. Although he was shot while he was holding the door, all but one of his 23 students safely made it out the windows before he succumbed to five bullets himself and died. Most of the students in the classroom at the time later wrote his son, calling him a hero. Most of us will never face a test that severe, but we all have moments when our faith and our courage are put to the test. Somebody says something and, and we know that's not right. Somebody needs to be defended. I mean, the list can go on. Whatever form those moments take, they reveal. They reveal whether we have faith and whether we have courage. And we need to grow every day in the wisdom and the character and the knowledge of God so that when that moment confronts us, and it will, our faith and our strength of character will be revealed. And while many would say, what kind of a God would allow evil like that? Why didn't he intervene? They forget that God placed Leviu Lebrescu and Joseph and people like you and I where he does so that we can be that light that points people to him. And then thirdly, God's plans always triumph. After Joseph was elevated to second in command of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh himself, Joseph learned the Egyptian language. He, he adapted to the Egyptian culture. He wore the Egyptian apparel. And consequently, when his brothers came to Egypt in search of food because of a famine, they didn't recognize their younger brother. I mean, we can only imagine what went through their heads when Joseph finally said, hey, it's me. 
they didn't think they'd ever see their little brother again. They thought, man, when they sold him to these slave traders who were on their way to Egypt, man, we washed our hands of him. Who would ever write a script like this? Well, God did. And God still does. And he uses our lives in writing those scripts. Many of the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's plan that will prevail. The Lord Almighty says, as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, it will happen. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Never, ever doubt what God is able to do. What made it possible for Joseph to rise from a victim to a victor? How did he overcome the obstacles and the roadblocks that Satan had placed in Joseph's journey? We would be wise to know because the answers to those questions might serve us well in transforming us from victims to victors as well. First of all, Joseph understood the importance of forgiveness. At some point, and, and we're not told where in the story, Joseph determined to forgive his brothers. I don't know what all went through his head. I gotta, gotta believe he's thinking to himself, you know, after a time, it's just not worth it. He refused to let their actions influence his attitude. Kimberly Fletcher is a sexual assault survivor, executive director of the Moms March movement. Referring to sexual assault, Fletcher said, and I saw this this past week, she said, and I quote, this idea that we are victims is actually hurting women. I decided I was going to be a victor. While none of us chooses to be victimized, we do choose whether to remain a victim. I chose to be a victor. The first steps begin with forgiveness. Oh, I can't do that. I mean, you don't know. You don't know what that person or those individuals, you, you have no idea how much they hurt me. Anything is possible with God. Jesus said you can pray for anything. And if you believe, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven can forgive your sins as well. I don't know if you've experienced this, but it seems to me that forgiveness always, always changes the person who is doing the forgiving. And oftentimes cha changes the person who is being forgiven as well. On November 13th of 2004, 44-year-old Victoria Ruvalo was two blocks from home in Long Island. Long Island and a 20-pound frozen turkey came crashing through her car windshield. Victoria's esophagus was caved in. Her cheek and jaw bones were completely shattered, as was the socket of one of her eyes. In, in addition, she suffered some brain damage. Ryan Cushing was an 18-year-old college freshman at the time. He and some teenage friends had purchased this frozen turkey with a stolen credit card and randomly chose a car to throw it into just for fun. The prosecuting attorney would later say, and I quote, victims in crimes like this often feel that no punishment is harsh enough. In fact, sometimes the death penalty doesn't even satisfy some victims. Well, Cushing was facing a possible 25-year sentence after which he would remain, return to society, a middle-aged adult with a criminal record and no job skills. Ruvalo didn't want that. She did extensive research on him. She had genuine compassion for this, her 19-year-old assailant. He was convicted of the crime, and at his sentencing, Victoria Ruvalo pleaded with the judge to give the young man mercy. Uh, the judge accepted her suggestion, sentenced the boy to six months in jail and one year of probation. On his way out of the courtroom, Ryan Cushing 
slowly walked to where Ruvalo was seated in the courtroom and with tears on his face whispered to her, I'm sorry for what I did to you. She stood up, embraced him, patted him on the back, and with both of them weeping said, it's okay, I want you to make your life the very best that you can. Seasoned reporters and lawyers were in that courtroom. They too were crying at what they just saw. Forgiveness is a divinely powerful weapon in the spiritual warfare that you and I wage on a daily basis. And if we would graduate from being a victim to being a victor, we must forgive those who have wronged us. Jesus reminded us it's not enough to love those who love us. It's not enough to forgive those we think deserve our forgiveness. The question he asked is, what are we doing more than others? What are we as followers of Jesus Christ doing more than those who don't follow him? And forgiveness is best practiced by those who realize how much we've been forgiven by him. Secondly, if we're going to become a victor instead of a victim, we need to focus on God's plans and not our hurt. We read in Matthew chapter 14, when Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water, man, he's got his eyes focused on Jesus, but it tells us there, when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he saw the waves and the the wind, he, he began to sink. The Hebrew writer reminds us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. I can't speak for you, but I I will say that far too often it seems like I, I focus on my hurts or or the mess. The world doesn't revolve around me; it revolves around the sun. S O N. And the quicker we can understand that, the quicker we can be victors. Jesus reminded us, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Paul said, I forget what's behind. And instead, I strain toward what is ahead, and that is the heavenly prize. Dwelling on the past, even focusing on the hurts in the present, they don't help anyone. Joseph's faith never wavered. Joseph trusted God to know what he was doing. Joseph believed that God's ways work, and they do. The challenge Moses presented to the people of Israel just prior to their entering into the promised land is a challenge I think that we still need to heed today. Moses said to them, and God is saying to us, I have given you the choice between life and death. I give you the choice between blessings or curses. I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself to him. Moses said, this is the key to your life. Unless the Lord builds the house, the life, the family, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, those who guard it do so in vain. God's ways work. They always have and they always will. And Joseph refused to be a victim. He forgave his brothers. He focused on God's plan in his life instead of the pain he had been through or the pain that he was in right now. Joseph says to his brothers, don't worry, you guys. We're good. We're good. Because it was God who sent me here for a greater good to save the lives of many people. Whatever mess that you've been in or mess that you're in or whatever mess you will be in in the future, whatever mess others may have put you in because of their decisions or their choices, 
we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us far more than any of us know. And it is Jesus Christ who transforms us from victims into victors. It is Jesus Christ who takes our mess, turns it into a message that we can use to point others to Him. The communion is a time for us to examine our own lives. Lord, what would you have me to do? Who would you have me to forgive? Let's pray. Lord, as we come to this time of communion, I dare say that we've all, we've all found ourselves in a, in a mess at some point in time. Some may be in one right now. And we believe you, God. We believe you as surely as Joseph believed in you. And we believe that there is a plan that you have for our lives, that you're going to take that which we're going through right now and somehow you're going to use it for our good and your glory. And we believe that, God. And if there are steps that we need to take for that to occur, I pray that you would reveal that to us right now as we partake of these emblems, reminding us of what Jesus went through so that we could be victorious. Holy Spirit, have your way in us at this time. In Jesus' name we pray.